I'm Mike Benedetti. I am out here on Sibley Farm with Colin Novick from the Greater Worcester Land Trust and Chris Leahy from Mass Audubon. This is a 350 acre property that various groups, including the town of Spencer, are considering preserving um, as open space. Why is this a, a great spot? Well, firstly, you usually don't get a chance to preserve so many acres at one time. And in terms of habitat, Having that many acres as one large block is tremendous. A second thing is the variety of habitats that are present here. Everything from forest to wetland to meadow to field. And then lastly, um, the state has listed this property as being of particular interest for the quality wetlands. Awesome. Chris? Yeah, no, I just uh, underscore what Colin said, uh, say it in a slightly different way, and that is uh, two of the main uh, you know, tenants of, of uh, land and wildlife preservation are one, bigger is better. Uh, so a chunk of land this big, this much acreage in Massachusetts, the uh, third most densely populated state in the country, is fantastic. And then the variety of, of uh, you know, open country sort of grassland and shrubland, as well as forest and wetlands and that kind of thing, uh, that kind of diversity is just uh, key for protecting wildlife and, and natural habitats. Chris, can you show us around? Sure. What is this field here? Yeah, so what you've got here, um, it's, it's quite interesting. One of the things, just by way of a little background, is that, as most people in Massachusetts, certainly in Worcester County, know, um, small farms are, are, are getting fewer. Uh, okay. There are not nearly as many small farms. This whole area was a very big sort of dairy area for many years. Okay. But gradually, with development, et cetera, uh, the farms are being sold off uh, for various kinds, of, uh, various kinds of development. So this kind of habitat, uh, agricultural land, but agricultural land in some cases that's left for part of the year uh, to go, you know, into this, you know, like this wonderful sort of milkweed field we've got here is fantastic habitat for certain kinds of birds that because uh, the farmland is, is diminishing, those birds are diminishing. Mass Audubon has just published a state of the birds report for Massachusetts. And one of the things, the groups of birds that are in biggest trouble are grassland birds and birds of sort of shrubby areas. What are those birds? Those are farmland birds. Uh, mm. Things like eastern meadowlark. Uh, this used to be one of our common roadside birds. Uh, American kestrel. Again, a common bird that you'd see on the phone wires. These birds are declining uh, dramatically. And it is this kind of habitat uh, that they require. And so as this kind of habitat declines, those birds decline as well. Hmm. So to have areas of agricultural land that continue to be managed under agricultural restriction or whatever uh, for this kind of open country is just fabulous for birds and all the other kinds of uh, organisms, plants and animals that live in these what, what the scientists call successional habitats. Uh, if we just let this... Uh, go for, you know, just didn't do anything to it, didn't mow it for hay or whatever, it would eventually return to forests, like pretty okay. much every place else in Massachusetts and New England. Um, so you have to manage it, you have to keep it open, which was done naturally with farming, um, but it's, it's critical if we want to maintain the populations of those sort of open country species. Is this milkweed out here? Okay, so this field, you know, again, you know, oh, it's just a field, but uh, fields are a kind of habitat. You, know, you want to call them something fancy like grassland or whatever, and they're filled with um, all kinds of plants that are essential to the wildlife and stuff that lives here. So this is milkweed. Pretty much everybody knows about milkweed, and at this time of year, you know, it's uh, flying off this is there. what it's doing. Uh, these are the seeds <laughs> on its little sort of parachutes. Okay, and this is of course seed dispersal. This is the way the milkweeds get to, you know, get the, spread their spread their seeds around, etc. But when this is, you know, green, when it's in leaf, etc., it's the food plant for uh, monarch butterflies, hmm. uh, which most people have some familiarity with these days. These are these amazing migratory butterflies. They grow up, so to speak. They lay their eggs on the milkweed. Uh, the eggs hatch into caterpillars, beautiful sort of tiger-striped caterpillars. Those caterpillars pupate, make a little pupa. Those hatch out into monarchs. And the last generation of those monarchs goes from here in Spencer and flies to Mexico, to the highlands of Mexico, to the sacred fir forest in the mountains of Mexico. They overwinter there, the same ones that hatched out here in Spencer. And then uh, they start back in like February and March. They stop along the way to breed, okay, just like I described before, and then their great grand, their grandchildren or great grandchildren arrive back here in Spencer, and the whole process starts over again. I didn't make that up. That's the truth. That's what actually sort of happens. <laughs> so, 
uh, that's the kind of little little miracle that ha that's happening all over. And and if we didn't have these open fields, um, you know, milkweed butterflies, at least in this part of the world, would would diminish. And we're losing this kind of open habitat all throughout New England, all throughout the Northeast, because of the loss of small farms and things like that. These grasses, again, you say, well, this is grass, you know, uh, what's the big deal? But again, these grasses are important food plants for a whole bunch of butterflies. There are a bunch of little beautiful little uh, yellow uh, butterflies called skippers, almost all of which feed on grasses and sedges. So um, in one sense, you're looking at cow food, uh, pasturage, uh, looking at hayfield, but you're also looking at an ecosystem, a grassland ecosystem. What I love is if you talk to people who are middle-aged, they'll talk about growing up and there were meadows and fields everywhere and everybody will talk about it and you'll get together and one of the first things that is just easy and obvious for them to be able to explain is that nowadays all the meadows and fields that they remember from their childhood have gone away. Yep. Yeah, and they, we get the same kind of at Mass Audubon. There are people who have these sort of memories of, of certain kinds of birds. We're talking about these open country birds and we have a project uh, to look at the, the decline of whippoorwills. Now, whippoorwill is kind of the, the voice of the night, the, the country voice of the night. And again, people of a certain age remember, oh yeah, especially in this neck of the woods, oh yeah, I remember, you know, evening would come and the whippoorwills would start calling and we'd hear them everywhere. And you know, we don't hear them anymore. Well, uh, that's partly because, you know, the habitat that whippoorwills need, this open country, the fields that you were talking about, um, aren't, you know, aren't, aren't here anymore. It, it may be for other causes as well. Whippoorwills are, are ground nesters. They nest on the ground. And so they're particularly vulnerable to uh, this great increase we've had in things like skunks and raccoons and feral cats that, you know, the whippoorwills become sort of easy, easy prey for. Hmm. But really it's the sort of that change in the landscape that people, you know, people who pay a bit of attention kind of realize is happening and it's, it's very, very real. So to protect uh, an area like this, a former farmland, uh, for all those qualities is, uh, is pretty important. Are these, oh, are these game trails through here? Yeah, it's a deer, uh, deer trail. Oh, deer. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What is this? Can you see that? Okay, so yeah. this is, I'm, I'm holding him very, very delicately. I'm not uh, destroying him. Okay. Um, he's still quite alive. And this is something called a clouded sulfur. Okay. Um, it's one of our sort of common uh, butterflies. Um, they feed and nectar. They, they're larvae. The caterpillar uh, eats uh, various kinds of uh, legumes, you know, pea family things, etc. Huh. And then the adults um, will nectar on all kinds of things. These flying around. This is October 10th. So this is the last brood of the season for these guys. And they're uh, feeding on... Um, you know, the last of the sort of the red clover that are yeah. here uh, in this field, etc. So this is one of uh, about 108 species of butterflies that uh, uh, breed in, in Massachusetts. Um, and again, this kind of habitat is, is critical for them. Most butterflies are not forest critters. There are a few forest butterflies, but most of them are critters of open fields. They feed on, um, you know, some tree species, but mostly trees like cherry that often occur at the edges of fields and things like that. So again, uh, lose fields, lose open country, uh, open country habitats, and we lose, uh, we lose butterflies. Hmm. <laughs> They're just kind of bopping around the top of the weeds there. Exactly, yeah. So this is early October. Uh, most of the warblers, the migrant warblers, have kind of moved through. There's kind of a late movement of certain species. There's a species that we might see today called yellow rump warbler, which is, gets common at this time of year. Um, but this is sparrow season. Uh, so at this time of year, I was out the other day in my own neighborhood and had seven different kinds of sparrows. This is, a, mm. this is sparrow time. And this kind of weedy field is another one of the huge values of this kind of open country. These weedy fields are critical feeding areas for uh, sparrows, like the ones that are, that are in here uh, eating this goldenrod seed uh, right now. So um, great, great for bird watching, but perhaps more importantly, uh, critical uh, habitat as these sparrows uh, move through um, and migrate. Uh, the, the sparrow I got a glimpse of here is a white-throated sparrow. That's a sparrow that does... A nest in Massachusetts, very pretty bird. The, the brightest males have a bright white throat and white crown with black stripes and a big yellow spot near the bill. 
and they nest they also nest in sort of scrubby habitat at forest edge and because again this habitat is, is declining in Massachusetts that species the white-throated sparrow um, is also declining but it's still um, a common migrant and uh, you know at this time of year you can still find sometimes in, in a you know on a good morning dozens of them uh, in places like this. Um, and, and where we are right here, the field is turning into the forest. Exactly, you know, th this and this, you know, we, we tend to think of this as kind of the, you know, the, you know, the end of one thing and the beginning of another, and it is, but what we tend to overlook often is, is what the ecologists call an ecotone. And an ecotone is a transition area between the grassland or the shrubland and, and the forest. And the ecotone tends to have its own special deal. It tends to be richer in species than either the forest or the grassland. And hmm. that's because they get species from the forest and they get species from the grassland, but they also get species that really like that sort of middle ground. So hmm. they tend to be very uh, rich places. And that's yet another value of having uh, openings like this that then butt up against the, the forest in the background. That's great. Where do you guys want to go next? Well, uh, at this point, we're close enough where we should probably head down to the, uh, the wetland of the bridge. All right. So we're, um, we're standing in an area of uh, a forest here, and in general, this is the very sort of typical um, central Massachusetts, it's called, it's called by a bunch of different names, but oak conifer forest kind of covers it in general. Okay. And if we look around us, <clears throat> we can see the characteristic species. Uh, this is white pine. That's obviously one of the con conifers. Okay. Et cetera, you can see, five, five needles, et cetera. And if you look back in the woods here, you see this great, uh, rather grand-looking tree, very dark, uh, et cetera. Um, and that's eastern hemlock. And this is one of the great forest giants that occurs here in Massachusetts. Uh, when you go into these very limited areas that are left now of old growth forest, very often some of the largest trees are eastern hemlock, like this. The, the usual oak in this kind of forest, uh, Worcester County, etc., is red oak. Okay. For no particular, it's not red for any particular sort of uh, yeah. reason, but that's very sort of uh, typical leaf. And are these also some maples mixed in Yes. Uh, uh, this kind of place would have uh, typically uh, maybe some sugar maples okay. uh, in the colder spots in the same kind of... The hemlock typically grows in fairly cold spots. And yeah, there's a sugar maple in back here already okay. uh, kind of turning yellow. Yeah. But this forest, what, what we're seeing here is a forest that is... It's a fairly young forest. These the yeah, these trees are not big. That's right, except for this hemlock uh, and this white pine. And you can see they're growing up above these... Uh, hardwood trees, which is what, what basically happens when you see um, white pines in the landscape. Very often they're a sign of where there was a settlement or a house or something before. They are um, generated, they're encouraged by sunlight, and the white pines grow up, and then gradually, and they create shade, and then the hardwoods, the oaks and the maples and the ashes, grow in that, in that shade, and you can see that sort of um, starting to go on, uh, go on here. Mm. But this is a fairly recent, uh, th this area, is, as you were pointing out, is quite young. And there are various signs. There's bracken fern growing out along the edge of the worried. path. And then if you look at this pretty tree with, where the leaves are shimmering, the yellow leaves. Yes. This is a, um, a, a poplar, a quaking aspen, it's sometimes called. And the leaves are attached in such a way that they, when the wind blows, they do this wonderful sort of jiggling kind of motion. Huh. And this is another tree. It's a very fast-growing tree. Uh, and it's another species that comes in very rapidly after there's been a fire. So you can look around at this landscape and, and you know, make some educated guesses about what, uh, what's going on here. Hmm. Colin, why is there a bridge here in the middle of the marsh? Uh, there's a bridge here because of the Snowbird Snowmobiling Club of Lester and Spencer. And one of the neat parts about uh, them is that when they're coming through the site, they only come through when there's a lot of snowpack. So their impact on the site that you see in front of you is fairly minimal because everything is mostly frozen and has died back. On the other hand, during the summertime, we have the benefit of their bridge. Yeah, this is a great example of what's special about this property. If we uh, look around, we can see um, a whole spectrum of different habitats. You can see the, you know, the oak conifer forest in the background with the white pines and the oaks sticking up above. You can see this transition area with the gray birches with the small leaves, which is characteristic of that sort of middle ground. You can see these bright orange and red trees are, are red maples, um, and they're the characteristic species of a, 
uh, a different forest type, sometimes called swamp forest, sometimes called red maple forest, um, with a whole bunch of different species that um, like that particular habitat. Uh, and that's a forest type that uh, likes to have its feet wet uh, most of the time and is flooded for part of the year and then dries okay. out sort of in the late summer. And then coming right down to this uh, stream uh, edged by cattail marsh. So mm. it's really a fantastic uh, combination of things and this is exactly the kind of place that's ideal for a, a reserve for conservation land because there's so much uh, species diversity. This kind of little slow stream uh, and marsh uh, very good for a wide variety of species of, of dragonflies and damselflies. Here's a very uh, attractive shrub, attractive and also kind of useful. This is a winterberry, it's a okay. kind of holly Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, you can kind of recognize the berries. The, the leaves are not like the Christmas holly. That's a different species. Yeah. Uh, but this is a very important tree. Um, so the berries start ripening at this time of year, quite, quite soft and very, very nutritious and very, very important for wintering birds, things like robins, uh, bluebirds that overwinter here, and uh, thrushes and various other birds uh, really gobble these berries up. They're so popular that usually by, by December, January, they're gone. Mm. <laughs> the trees are denuded because they're so popular with the birds. Very, very pretty, pretty tree. <laughs> Where are, what are all these paths from through here? Uh, these are cart paths, and they would have been for two things. The first of which is to link the different agriculture fields together so the farmers could actually go back and forth. And the second is for logging. Uh, a number of these paths that you'll come across in the woods sort of head off into a wonderful stand or into a, a wetland area, and all of a sudden they just simply stop. Hmm. And that would be where they finished doing a cut. They would have loaded up the logs and headed back. So you have this fun network of interconnections between the different fields, and then these sort of dead-end spurs that would have been used for logging. So these are old? These are very old. In fact, this farm itself goes a long way back. I wouldn't at all be surprised if some of the paths we're walking right now couldn't easily be 150 years old. You come out of the dark hemlock forest and, and out into the sort of open woodland with the beaches and stuff and the whole you know, your kind of mood changes. It's quite striking. <laughs> this is American chestnut. Okay. And uh, a lot of people know this story, but uh, we talked about the hemlock adelgid early, and uh, this is another story where this was one of the major constituents of our New England forest with large trees, uh, you know, uh, growing, you know, 40 feet high or whatever. Um, and it was wiped out, uh, again, by the accidental introduction of a... Uh, of a fungus, uh, and so now uh, in our forest we still have chestnuts. They still grow, uh, but they they and some of them will even get mature enough to bear some some nuts. But they never reach sort of uh, forest size. Oh. Now some people foresee that eventually they will, and there are a lot of people working on hybridization and looking at places in North America where. Um, the, they were resistant to this uh, chestnut blight, mm. uh, but it, it shows you the level of change that can occur, a uh, huge level of change, uh, based, you know, partly on human behavior. At one time, you'd walk through this forest, and it would have been, you know, perhaps dominated by American chestnut, and now this is kind of, uh, we it's only have like this vestige of it. Maybe seven feet tall, yeah, so if it's like lucky. Yeah, it would have been part of the, would have been part of the canopy, one of the canopy species, basically, back in the, as late as, I think, maybe the 20s or something like that, so... Mm. It, in the local area, you'll notice that there are a lot of mill buildings. And inside the mill buildings, the structural supports that run back and forth are more often than not actually big chestnut beams. Huh. And when you look at them, it's not unusual to find a 12 or 15 inch wide beam that runs the length of a building. And it gives you a sense of the trees that were growing here that were chestnut. Hmm. How long ago was this area logged, do you think? Oh, I would say 30, 40 years, okay. somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, not much more than that, I wouldn't say, looking at the size of the trees. Mm. So this yeah. is a pretty young, young forester here. This oak tree has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stems. And oak trees don't naturally <clears throat> grow multiple stems. They grow one stem. The only time you'll get multiple stems out of an oak tree is when it's been cut flush as a stump as part of a cutting operation. Hmm. And then all these little sprouts grow up around the outside of the stump and they compete to be the main stem. And if you give it long enough, uh, the lesser ones will slowly die back and fall off and you'll usually end up with two or three main stems that make up the tree. Right now they're still fighting it out like uh, young are. kids in a family to figure out who's going to be the big boss.
What happened to this tree? It's uh, like... This is a beaver, and what ends up happening with the really large trees the beavers will use for dams is they'll go around and they'll cut that outside edge. And you remember all the life of the trees in that thin xylem and phloem layer that goes around mm. the outside. So what they're doing is girdling it. So they'll cut around the outside edge, it will kill the tree, and they'll basically sit back. Come back a couple years later, the tree will <laughs> fall over and they'll drag it over to the water and use it for what they want. But it's much easier than having to cut through the whole thing. That's the lazy man's technique. <laughs> Up here, you can actually make out the individual sort of tooth marks on it. It's pretty great. Cutting away at stuff. It's good. Been, extra. It's been busy. And uh, one of the th reasons that the town of Spencer's been down here is because uh, they've been keeping an eye on the beavers. There's a pond in the northwest corner of the property. And they've been keeping track of beaver activity because there is a town water line that runs through the property. Ah. So uh, they've been watching the beavers, watching the beaver dams, and uh, it's clear that the beaver is currently present and chopping away. Uh, the fun part at this point would be that the beaver, if you cut something down, would use these as roads to move the logs back and forth. Well, these little swampy areas. Absolutely. In many cases, they'll not only do that, but they'll actually pull it up. If you look on the edges there, mm -hmm. see how the mud has been padded to the side? Sure. The beaver will actually create canals. And oh, when they really? take down branches, they'll actually run them along these water roads to wherever it is that they're building their structures. So out here by this pond, we see some ducks and we see a beaver lodge over here. That's pretty great. Um, what kind of ducks do we find in a pond like this? Well, at this time of year, as the fall moves on, there are, uh, you know, any of a dozen species that might occur here on migration. Um, one of the most interesting ducks that nest in a place like this is something called a wood duck. Um, and it's one of our most uh, spectacular duck species with bright iridescent color on the heads of the males, and a red bill, etc. And these are ducks that um, nest in trees. They mm. nest in, uh, in the old days, they would nest in old, and still nest in like old woodpecker holes, holes made by the big, great big pileated woodpecker. And they sight, they pick a tree that's out over water so that when the young uh, hatch, uh, the young ducklings, they just plop out of the hole and right down into the water where they don't get hurt and will be relatively uh, sort of secure. So these wood ducks uh, were um, hunted out uh, at a given period in our history here, but people figured out uh, in order to bring them back that they could make birdhouses essentially wood duck boxes and site them in places like this and the wood ducks would take to them so that now uh, wood ducks have really come back and they're really one of our um, commoner native ducks nesting in this kind of uh, wetland habitat. Hmm. And we see a ton of trees around here that have been chopped down cut by these beaver right? Yep. And uh, this is their this is their lodge so there's probably beaver living in there Yes, yeah, uh, beavers are uh, typically active uh, at sort of early in the morning and in the evening. That's when they're kind of most active. Sure. So at this time of day with bright sunlight, you're out. not likely to see them. They're in the lodge or whatever, but they're, they're around. This is a stone wall. Absolutely. These would be the stone walls to be out at the edges of the field. Okay. And Does that mean we're coming up on a We are coming up on a up field. On field. Right here. And we're also coming up... On a segment of the Mid-State Trail. Whoa, the Mid-State Trail. This goes from... Rhode Island all the way up to New Hampshire. And it goes right through central Massachusetts, and it passes through Leicester and Spencer along the way. And this project and this property would have the opportunity to protect a section of the Mid-State Trail. That's awesome. So here, as predicted, is a field. And it's much... It's a lot taller of a field. <laughs> Absolutely. This is one of the overgrown fields that stretches across the Warner Farm all the way down to Greenville Street. And these fields are a real opportunity. They have a little bit of wildlife which goes on in them right now, but because of how tall they are and because of the species that there are, there isn't an awful lot um, of, of species that are making use of this. If we were to turn this either into a haying field or we were to turn this into sort of a low brushy meadow that you went after and paid attention to uh, breeding season, this could be an enormous opportunity for wildlife habitat. Hmm. Uh, so when we look at this, you may not see an awful lot presently in terms of wildlife, uh, but as conservationists, we look at this and see an enormous opportunity, just acres and acres of potential oh. field habitat. So these fields are running uh, north off of Greenville Street, okay. and over on this side you've got a stone wall, and on the opposite side of the stone wall, heading down slope, is the uh, sanctuary by Mass Audubon called Burncoat Pond. Okay. Uh, in fact, where we were with the wood ducks in the two beaver lodges is right over in the area where the Burncoat Pond Sanctuary and the Sibley Warner Farm properties come together. Um, 
Also, to the north of that, Leicester has a recreation area. Oh. Um, and as a result, if we were to protect this, you would have a block of land which would be in excess of 500 acres. And that's really substantial and significant for habitat. Oh, yeah. Well, guys, thanks for showing me around. This is really a, a unique piece of land and that um, uh, it, it has high significance for wildlife value and, and just the, um, the New England landscape. Uh, so I uh, certainly hope that it can be preserved. And thank you very much for taking a walk with us out at the Sibley Warner Farm and we hope to see you soon.